At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often and make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education, and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 7, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeve. The Reeve was something of a local administrator, and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor, as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord, and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically, and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. 
The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits, and so they would be given a large ladle, and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been, and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare, so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, cup bearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number 2, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale, and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally at number 1, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the middle ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Starting our list off at number 10, a banker. Today online banking is easy, right? It's a little bit too invasive at times, I don't know. I get an email from my bank, it's like, Mr. McWaters, do you want to provide for your family? I'm like. Chill, relax. Back in the old west, you didn't get a courtesy check-in email. You didn't have overdraft. In fact, the United States national banking system, well, it didn't even exist until 1863. Before then, you'd have what were called wildcat banks. And well, these were pretty fun. Here we go. What they would do is wildcat banks, they would take deposits for a short amount of time, collect your life savings, and then unannounced randomly, they would disappear overnight. Just take all your money and then run for the woods. How horrible is that? Imagine going to the bank the next day and it's gone. The bank's just not there. You're standing there with a card. Like, um, hello? Where did I put this in? You're telling me they pretended to be bankers for months at a time? Fake mustache? Oh, hello, sir. Good morning. Stamping things that aren't even real. They did all of that, and then they just ran away with all of your money. That's wild. I get it now. I get it. The Wild West. After 1863, a noble profession was to work at a bank, you know, and not screw people over for thousands of dollars. The Hudson Bay Company, Wells Fargo, these are all names that began because of these fake Looney Tune wildcat banks. So next time you see your bank call, be thankful. Don't be stressed. Be thankful. 
They've got your back. They're not gonna run away overnight. Number nine, ranch work. Alrighty, I can't do yard work. I don't know if you can tell by my physical being, but I can't lift a brick. My back doesn't allow me to reach the floor. A weird curve in the back, I don't know. Pulling weeds physically hurts my soul. Or maybe I'm just lazy. One of the two, I don't know. Either way, the Old West would have been the end of Taylor McWaters. To be a cowboy, it meant lots and lots of ranch work. It wasn't all yees and haws and kicking around. A lot of the time, you were protecting your cattle. That's stressful, right? All that meat just sitting there in the 1800s, good luck. Cowboys earn between 25 to $40 a month. Yeah, which sounds laughable now, but today that would be around $1,500 a month, which is fine. I mean, for a cowboy, I don't know, it's a bit, less than. Do cowboys get sick days? Probably not, they probably just get sick. Number eight, railroad work. This is one of the few jobs from the old west that I actively see every single day coming to work. Living downtown, they're always adding trains and bridges and not finishing any of them. And ideally, you don't want any toxic substance traveling down those lines, right? Fingers crossed. Well, back in the Old West, railroads were meant to assist the booming mining and ranching industries. Thing is, there weren't enough hands. There was not enough to keep up with the rate that they needed to. Like, who's gonna build a railroad? You know, who was the first person? Railroad workers, monthly, you'd make around $1,000, and this brought a wave of immigrants to the West. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads, they all lay over 1,700 miles. Now, making this actual railroad, it destroyed the bodies of these workers, but without it, American history would not be the same. Couldn't imagine making a railroad. Bro, that is exhausting. Number seven, blacksmith. All right, close your eyes and imagine a blacksmith. Just any blacksmith from any time. Is he bald? Does he have a massive beard? Is he incredibly strong and wildly intimidating? Yeah, that checks out. That's what a lot of them look like. Missing teeth, banging something pretty loud. That's a blacksmith. Frontier times were almost a golden time for blacksmiths, believe it or not. Hammers, horseshoes, new railroads. It checks out. No, they didn't need any chain mail, but a saddle wouldn't hurt, that's for sure. We could use a saddle. They would earn up to $200 a day. Blacksmiths were always busy in the Old West. They doubled as auto repair services really at the same time. I mean, I don't know. A guy comes in with a busted up carriage. Well, now you're a mechanic. Yeah, go fix his wooden car. Good luck, you have one day. Here's 10 bucks. Number six, journalism. Believe it or not, the newspaper business cleaned up shop back in the frontier. Everyone wanted to know what the tea was. Tuscan, Arizona, for example, back in the day, back in 1831, that one town had five different newspapers. Yeah. Even though there are only 465 residents, there are five different papers. That's stressful. How do you keep up with that much news? I mean, to be fair, before radio and television, yeah, there's probably lots to talk about all day long. That's pretty much all you can do, just talk all day long. So I get it. The industry provided jobs as well. It's very much like YouTube. Here, there's writers, there's hosts, the design and print staff, we have editors. It was a little easier than laying down a railroad, that's for sure. So when it came to jobs, yeah, journalism wasn't that bad. Definitely better than doing anything that has to do with this motion, that's for sure. Number five, mining. A study done at a mine in Butte, Montana found that miners were dying from tuberculosis. A lot, like 10 times more than they should be. Not should be, but you get what I'm saying. The mining industry is crazy dangerous. Safety was often overlooked and the health of these miners was, well, non-existent at the time. The first gold rush was back in 1799. This kicked off everything. A young man named Conrad Reed, he found this bright yellow rock he had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, actually used it as a door stopper. Yeah, the 17 pound nugget of gold, just keeping a swift breeze rolling through. It's worth a bit more than a door stopper today, and this actually ended up changing the entire industry. Gold mining got so popular that Congress had to build the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina alone. It's pretty cool. You have to make a mint? That's how much money you're making? Buddy, I want a mint. Number four, law enforcement. Of course, this too was a little different back in the Old West. There are not many body cams back then, I'll tell you that for free. Movies and television, they like to show the Old West as a lawless, rootin' tootin' time. And while sure, some of that is true, it wasn't as terrible as we think. Like A Million Ways to Die in the West, Red Dead Redemption, it wasn't that crazy because before any formal law enforcement agency did pop up, everybody was a bounty hunter, right? Why not? There's nothing else to do. Go lay a bunch of bricks or go catch a bad guy. 50-50, both are quite dangerous. Eventually, positions like that of a US Marshal began to pop up more and more, and well, now there's a bit more order to the system, that's for sure. A bit, just a little bit. Number three, barkeep. 
All right, I love pubs, big old fan of pubs. Never been to a Wild West rootin' tootin' pub, but I'm in no rush. They always have weird drinks like venom snake juice or whatever, like spider ale. I'm like, I don't want any of these poisons. How about a beer? Just a beer, thanks. Bars in the Wild West, eh, not so fun. Not a lot of open mics going on back then in the 1800s. No karaoke night back then. See, back then, these saloons were just for business. That's it. You don't have a mustache and a business plan, get out. In the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel. You imagine that? In the Yukon, their shot of whiskey was 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day, but if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in, I don't know, Colorado, it'd be a lot cheaper. Pretty ruthless. That's rootin' tootin' ruthless. The odd time you would have poker, dice, maybe some guy in a piano with some jazz fingers, sure. But most of the time, business only. When saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, or gamblers. If you don't have any of those three, you're thirsty, go gamble, go grab a dice and come back. Number two, resurrectionalist. Yeah, you don't see a lot of these guys around anymore, eh? I wonder, wonder where they all went. A resurrectionalist is exactly what it sounds like. It's very gross, you're trying to bring someone back to life, I guess. Not really. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies and then they would sell them to medical schools in the West. Now, I remind you, this was the late 1820s, so yeah, it was fine, I guess. This practice began in Edinburgh, Scotland. The medical science community was on the up and up, but in order to study new medicines, you know, to avoid the next plague or the next toxin rolling through your system, they needed these guys to come in and do the dirty work. Today, the medical community is a bit different. We're a bit, you know, smarter with things, but hey, never say never. A resurrectionalist might come back to life and be a new profession. How ironic. And finally, number one, medicinal showmen. Ah, uh, yes, we'll end on this note. Step right up and see something that doesn't work. A fake product. Yes, here we go. I'm doing a fake shoe. A fake shoot, a fake show. I don't know. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s specifically, they had what's called medicinal showmen, right? You won't believe your eyes. Do you have ste uh, strep throat? Come on up, here we go. Definitely gonna fix that. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, whatever. But it was all about the pitch. That's pretty much all they had. They would have pawns, like their buddies, run ahead into town and then plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient that he knew was there, and then boom, just like that, he's cured. Almost like a magic show, right? Some would think, full of lies. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, and it was wildly popular. They toured with this elixir. They had to tell everybody in every town. They said it could treat any illness, but in reality, it was just a laxative, just a, just a mess, just a show, really. So don't believe everything you hear, except for today. Today we're a bit smarter, back then, not quite. And at number 10 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so Egyptian jewelers followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements, but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. For number nine, it's house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession, and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now, what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. 
You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women, and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Number eight is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances, like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with high hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair, and the mesh-like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixatives so that it would harden when cool. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time and while yes they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Thing. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks, and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number six, we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt, this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs, and they spread rapidly through the brothels, and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number five are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked, pun intended. So first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family family pyramid. Also, her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now, royal families only wanted high status wet nurses, and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre-definitive wages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing, despite that her breasts should be medium, too small, not enough food, too big, the baby 
baby spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves, they were coerced for their milk. As lower social status women, they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the same page, surrogates are number four. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body, and naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some, it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number three, and so while it was a male dominated field, many women were employed as a priestess or a high priestess at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests, which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paket, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestess was known as the god's wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestess was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestess and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nephthys' name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions, such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE. So maybe Maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, 
Serket, and Nefertum, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. Number 10, knocker upper. All right, sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like rather? That's 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now going from house to house, using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure, it's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so you know I'm sure the knocker upper came around today. Be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker uppers back in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14. Thank you. It was a big deal. It was definitely a big deal. Number nine. The Linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you probably get lost. Cause yeah, even London now I'd get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a Linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you do it, I guess? It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel, it's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other, that doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You get to step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The Linker Man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous Linker Men, famous Linker Mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal Linker Boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there are people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns. That's what I did. The camera, of course, was a hot new invention back then. So tales of ghost and spirit were easily believed, especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like, that's that's mom. That's definitely not, you just did that in the back room. That's, I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane, science or not? What are we doing here? Number seven, grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know that something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. The special door would reveal a layer of glass. 
Yeah. So if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit. Just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin. That's disgusting. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously, you know what's going to happen with the name the rat catcher. It's going to make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England. They were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's got to do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job, obviously, wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now. Not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 1926. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is, of course, extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was, of course, done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this, and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus the entire shift. History is horrible. Number four, resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study here? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck. It sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know, don't drop them, hmm? all that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Oliver Twist is like, this one sucks, one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it, you have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victorian London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you were uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. 
And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men. Guys, I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? You could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya, just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything, just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little brush. Why do all chimney sweeps have a tiny brush? Give them a bigger brush, you know? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required waiting in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our Number 9 spot today we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carding, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Groom of the Stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean, it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries, it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the Groom of the Stool comes in, this high level noble would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number 7 spot today, we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the Yes, jobs from the medieval times, and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls, which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank, and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness, and they were motivated to gather as much as possible 
possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous too. I mean if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today we have a sin eater. Okay, This is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this, they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread, they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically, sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. No, both bad. In our number 5 spot today we have the executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. While there is of course now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge hooded evil people, history shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people People of course saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience, other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence, and most commonly people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious, another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Execution Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number 4 spot today we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay? really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began and after that it was time for twisting. In our number 3 spot today we have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem and these rats were filthy and full of disease and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables and herbs in the case of emergency and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connections were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number 2 spot today we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring, it's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the middle ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, and this was the job 
top of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. Number 10, watching paint dry. Do you remember that thing that camp counselors used to do when the whole camp, if they were like acting crazy, they'd get you to sit down all together and like watch the paint dry? And if somebody like, little Timmy spoke out, then you'd have to restart. Anybody else do that? Just me? Okay, <laughs> fun. Anyways, so imagine my surprise to learn that something that was used as a mild punishment is the actual job of a man named Keith Jackson. Jackson lived in the UK and his job was literally to watch paint dry. He worked for a paint manufacturer and had to determine how well the paint was drying. So according to Jackson, it actually had some pretty high stakes, and I quote, watching paint dry sounds quite easy, but it can be stressful at times. Unquote. The more you know. Number nine, a crime scene cleaner. Of course someone has to do this. It is definitely a job I believe exists. Though I never really thought of it existing, I just thought they would just clean it up. But anyways, it definitely exists because we would know if someone had died in the house we were about to buy because it would still be a mess. But imagine the things you would see and how awful that would be. How do you even get a job like that? I do know that there are a lot of crime enthusiasts on this site, so I googled it. Turns out there is a job application, so you can just apply. It is for a company called Aftermath Services in Vancouver, and it's a $500 sign on bonus. Guess they're really looking for workers. Whatever brave souls are out there, we thank you for your service. Also, here's a perk. Considering the nature of this work, it definitely sounds like it's recession proof. Number eight, roadkill collector. Speaking of a crime scene cleaner, next up we have a roadkill collector. Yeah, this might be news for some of you who thought the squirrel you hit just like melted into the pavement after a few days of cars going over it. But no, this job actually exists and it's not mm, ideal. The task is sometimes grueling because often the poor little babies are, you know, well in the middle of the road. So they have to run out and scrape and scoop the critter out of there, all while like avoiding all the cars coming at them, otherwise trying to make them roadkill as well. On top of that, considering the conditions in which they perished, the stench and scenery is enough to churn even a sewer rat stomach, so. Number seven, a telemarketer. I know, we all know these exist, but like, I actually don't think anybody actually thinks about a telemarketer as an actual job. There are always the people that call you right as you're about to sit down for dinner being like, do you wanna buy this toy spork? And you're like, no, I don't wanna do that. I've seen people toy with them, I've seen people hang up the phone right away, like you know if you pick up the phone and no one is there right away, like hang up. If someone says hi, I'm calling on that, like you just hang up. They get told no in so many creative ways. It's almost like a special skill to be able to, <laughs> to, be able to receive that much rejection consecutively. Wow, it's like being an actor. <laughs> but many people depend on this job as they're living and experience verbal abuse from many customers. Having to endure that kind of negativity all day, every day, would be pretty hard to handle. So maybe we can be a little kinder. On top of that, they get paid most of the time on score-based systems, so they can't really take no for an answer until they've given it their best shot. So. Like, eh, just polite, be as polite as possible, but I get it, it's super annoying. Number six, snake researcher. It shouldn't be a surprise to you that of course we are going to bring up Mike Rowe, the dirty job man of the hour. I like snakes. I feel like there are two kinds of people, the people who are like afraid of snakes, but not spiders, and then the people who are afraid of spiders, but not snakes, you know what I mean? I'm the latter, so when I saw this job, I didn't think it would be awful at all, but it's nowhere near what you think. Mike Rowe says this is one of the grossest jobs he's ever done because, and I quote, to properly study the feeding habits of water snakes in Michigan, snake researchers pull large snakes from Lake Erie, squeeze them until they puke, then analyze their vomit to see what they've been eating. It's as disgusting as it sounds, but on the day in question, to add to the excitement, I was bitten no less than three dozen times. Annoying, bloody, and very dirty, unquote. Mike Rowe, oh, we salute you. Number five, an animal inseminator. We basically crack the semen off them, we freeze it, we chill it, and we send that semen globally. Rather than having to take the stallion to the mare, 
you can ship it around anywhere. Okay, so this exists. Though this guy seems to be absolutely like loving his job, which is great. People who do this for a living are essential for breeding purposes, though it is definitely not for everybody. Without going into too much detail, I'm going to try to describe this job as creatively as possible. In many ways, this job requires the employee to act as both lover and stork for certain animals such as cows and horses. The reason it exists is for the convenience of better breeding because they don't have to travel a breed or wait for them to mate. So instead, they position themselves to cat their mini selves and then they manually inject them into mares like cows for example and horses so not a very romantic process but then again whatever gets the job done I suppose but the grossest part like the grossest part even if you can't get your head around the other bit oftentimes the animal reacts to the injection of the baby juice by pooping really close to the inseminators face so like Definitely not for the faint of heart. Number four, shark soup tester. This list is basically partially in honor of every dirty job Micro has ever done. So he's gonna be featured again. Why putting a synthetic body within a chainmail suit wouldn't be a viable option for testing this? Apparently it isn't. There are not many jobs Micro found difficult to muster courage for, but this job remains in his top five jobs he wouldn't do again. According to Roe, quote, the only way to see if a stainless steel shark suit works is to put one on and jump feet first into a full on feeding frenzy, to be bitten by a variety of hungry sharks and shook like a tug toy for 60 feet below the surface. I did this job for Shark Week against my better judgment, but live to tell the tale. Not dirty, but straight up terrifying. I won't be doing it again, ever. Unquote. Like, Mike Rowe, if you ever watch the show Dirty Jobs, Mike Rowe has gone through a lot. Like, he went and checked out a bunch of different jobs, and he doesn't have to, even have to do each one for the rest of his life. He just tried a bunch of different ones. Great show, but if, like, that scared him, it sounds terrifying. That's not a job I would like to do. Number three, pet food taster. Ice cream taster, amazing. Chip flavor taster, yes please. Sommelier, sign me up. But did you know there was such a thing as a pet food taster? Good to know that at least the flavor profile is human approved for your pupper, but imagine tasting that for a living. Also, it is pet food, so it could be dog food, but it could also be like bird seed or bunny pellets. However, it does take a very highly skilled person to do it as it's a combination of research and taste. They have the job of evaluating a pet's nutritional value in their food and are tasked with finding ways they can improve that. But eventually, they do have to sample it, put it on a little bib. Yum. They evaluate the scent as it has to do with both human senses. After all, you don't want the house stinking like fish or dog food. And as well, and most importantly, for the pet. Thankfully, they do spit it out after reviewing the flavor, texture, and consistency. Unless it's really good. They probably just make that their lunch time. Number two, a chicken sexer. Uh, uh, what a title, you know? <laughs> what do you do for a living? I'm a chicken sexer. How do you bring that up to your in-laws? I'm not sure if my life is better knowing that the job of a chicken sexer actually exists, but for all the chicken that is consumed every day, it is really important. A chicken sexer's job is to distinguish the sex of a hatchling. Sounds okay so far, but it's how they do it that often gets really messy. The first version of this technique isn't so bad. Feather sexing is only done on broiler chickens that have a genetic mutation where female Male feathers grow faster, therefore they can kind of tell. But vent sexing is a little, you know, interesting. They have to hold a chicken a certain way and very gently squeeze the poop out so they can see the intestines. Then they can see the reproductive organs, which therefore determines the sex. This method was invented in the 1930s in Japan and though effective, not the prettiest job. But hey, 60K a year, not bad. Number one, last but not least, a sewer inspector. Number one, here we go. I think this is pretty self-explanatory, so if you want to skip ahead to liking and commenting portion of this video, then I won't blame you. But in the words of yet again, the one, the only, Mike Rowe, aside from sloshing through relentless chocolate tide, inspectors encounter a myriad of man-made products that shouldn't be flushed down the toilets along with roaches the size of thumbs and rats the size of bread loaves. It's hot, dirty, and too smelly to describe." Unquote. God! 
No thank you, never gonna do that. I don't know if you could pay me enough. If I'm being honest, but you can make anywhere from 52 to 72 grand a year for this dirty job. And as you can probably guess, it is essential. It is a privilege to be able to flush away our problems. So, so to all those watching who may work as sewer inspectors or in the sewer industry, we salute you. Kicking off our list at number 10, ship surgeon. Ah yes, just the place you want to get a root canal, the high seas. During the age of sail, the Royal Navy of course needed trained medical officers aboard its warships. People got sick, obviously, they got sick a lot back then, so this is who would have to deal with them. By 1814, the Royal Navy had 850 surgeons with 500 assistants all caring for 130,000 men on shore and at sea. Yeah, they would make a lot of money, but in turn, it's a disgusting job. The surgeon was responsible for his entire crew. They would have to visit patients at least twice a day and keep accurate records on each of them, again, on a ship. Not a hospital, but on a rocking ship. Surgeons were responsible for regulating sanitary conditions on the ship. Yes, sand would have to be poured down on the bottom of the cabins to avoid the doctors slipping from all the blood on the ground. Yeah, it's, it's that kind of gross, you know what I mean? Number nine, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, we imagine the swinging doors, a few catchphrases here and there, and then of course, whiskey. The bartender pours a drink, the cowboy takes the bottle instead, and then walks away, so illegal. Sir, that is theft, bring that right back. That's a classic cowboy, right? Back in the wild western days, grabbing a drink at the bar sucked. It wasn't great, it was deadly, if anything. Bartenders had no regulations to follow behind that rickety, rotten bar. So, not only was it very high proof, but some bevies like tarantula juice, yeah, if it's name didn't tip you off, it was literally made from poisonous ingredients, hence tarantula juice. It was made from strychnine, and if you drank it, you felt like there was tarantulas crawling all over your skin. Yeah, which button do I press to not tip the bartender? Thanks, thanks so much. Number eight, medieval punishment cleaner. If this isn't your first rodeo here on Bumblebee, you've heard us talk the many horrors of medieval history. A lot, of, uh, a lot of heads coming off around a lot of horrible kings. Many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and walk home. This was normal back then. So gross. One of the earliest documented executioners began all the way back in 1202, the OG headsman, Nicholas Yuhan. Their nickname was The Justice, which I mean, as far as nicknames go, it's pretty sick. Afterwards, of course, there was inspiration. This position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, but with them came the execution cleaners. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yep, hope you like mopping. You'd be doing a lot of that over with uh, King Henry. Number seven, violin string maker. A violin may sound beautiful, but the way those strings would come together, even before the 17th century, not so lovely, not so, uh, it's kind of yuck. In order to make strings thick enough to play these three stringed violins, the go-to method back then involved twisting strands of sheep innards together. Yeah, hours would have to be spent just trimming away at fatty tissue or blood vessels, muscle, you name it, things you don't want to see or smell. Yeah, you got to sift through that for a bit. It did not look like a music shop at that moment, yuck. And then said guts had to be soaked in wood ash to further clean and avoid rotting. Nowadays, it's a little different. Actually, not really, it still sucks for animals, but you know, less bloody, less dirty, I guess, all around. Number six, nomenclator. Basically, a campaign volunteer back in the Middle Ages. Only you weren't a volunteer, and the campaign was a miserable fat king. A nomenclator in old European times was responsible for remembering names of people that the king met all night long. You know, how to contact new business partners, which family they're in, which family they're not in, you know, keeping track of all the social politics of being a king. All that responsibility fell on the nomenclator because the king was too busy getting drunk and partying or cheating or beheading. No way a drunken king is gonna remember all these new faces from all over the land. That's, that's all this poor fella over here. Sorry, was it Arthur or Arnold? Yeah, I can't hear you over all this capital punishment. Thanks, you have to speak up a bit. Number five, the bone grubber. Heading to the Victorian era, a classic time to be grossed out by everything in sight. More than fair, the great stink, oh God. Victorian cities back in the day had this huge scavenging economy. I'll get more of that later on in this list, but the bone grubber, this was unique. This was a unique role in history. These workers would scavenge rotting bones from butchers or garbage piles. Wherever leftover meat was disposed and then animals hadn't got to them yet. That's where we're heading here. To then later on, sell them to dealers. Ideally, the bones would be made into toothbrush handles or teething rings, anything really. Creativity was booming, I guess. The rest would go into soap making. Yeah, it was just melted and then 
put on you and everywhere. So if you have any bones, hey, reach out. There you go. We'll DIY it up in the comments. Number four, fullers. Urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile. Awesome. They also used urine to wash their clothes. This isn't news. They didn't use soap back then because the amount of ammonia in urine just often did the trick. So, you know, and also it's free. Why not? Lye was also used to clean clothes at the time, but it was pricey. So plan B was to head down to the old laundromat and hand over your dirties to a fuller. Yeah, these lucky lads would have to stand in a tub filled with chemicals, water, and you guessed it, lots of urine. So much. Urine collected from all over the town, if I might add. Not just, you know, one dude, hey, I'm saving up. No. If you've got it, bring it. Bring over the piss. They would then scrub and stomp out all of the yuck. And then it would get in your mouth and splash up in your eyes. Horrible. Meaning most of the time, they were getting quite sick. Yeah, dangerous and disgusting job. Number three, resurrectionalist. All right, shout out to all the vampires watching. Nice, this one's for you. Hit that thumbs up, Dracula. A resurrectionalist was responsible for digging up dead bodies and then they would later sell them to medical schools. This was the late 1820s and at this time in Edinburgh, Scotland, the medical science community was changing history. It was on the up and up, it was inclining. But in order to study new medicines to, you know, avoid the next plague, they needed these guys, sadly. I'll tell you who they didn't need though, William Burke and William Hare. Yeah, these Irish brothers were both resurrectionalists, in quotes, who were running out of patience. So they themselves would go and take people out and then proceed to sell their bodies right after. They did this 17 times. They killed 17 people all in the course of two years. They sold all their corpses to Dr. Robert Knox. It took 17 killings before somebody caught on. This is horrible. Even when there's no system in the works, this job is still nasty. You know what I mean? Remember dissecting that frog in high school? This is like... You know, you don't even want to know. It's way worse, way worse. Number two, tushers. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even legal. Yeah, double, double the fun, there we go. Early 19th century London, a little more modern here, but worth a mention. These tushers would spend all their time in the sewers below London just trying to find coins or valuables. Anything that's been accidentally washed or forgotten. That's how hard it was finding work back then. You had to climb into sewers to hopefully find some old earrings, maybe just searching for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim. Now, sometimes it was worth the plunge. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year, but then again, a lot of them wouldn't. They would just go down, find nothing, get sick, and that's the end, horrible stuff. And finally, number one, rat catchers. As the name hint towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats, right? There has to be some rat guy. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. And with these castles being dark and spooky and ominous and you have to walk through and do this a lot, there are probably plenty of rats below crawling around your feet. You wouldn't even see them. Black rats were a common household problem, so in comes the well-respected rat catcher. It's catching all those rats. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of the rats. Uh, yeah, that's hilarious, that's hilarious. Like you're Doctor Strange trying to do a spell, all the rats just plunge out of the sewers. If it worked, I'd shit my pants. But more often than not, that didn't work. So poison powders were the main trick of the trade for a rat catcher. The Pied Piper, he was an OG. He did musical numbers, pests came out, people were moving around, it was good. No one does it like him. Any rat catchers out there, you deserve a bonus. Especially now, ew, basements are way grosser, I think, in my opinion. Uh, hoarders, disgusting. Don't even get me started on hoarders. Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time, or farming Fran time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number nine, beer maiden. This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. 
I can't imagine the bar maidens of Yieldy Times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either, but basically they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France, it was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five. Queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it, seriously. Although I'd certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie. Nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserve, and every girl does, queens just had it better. And that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken. Brush a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him, he's a chef, he said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly. Becoming a woman of God, was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then, seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed. Staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible. And probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks. And if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. 
Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artists. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica, Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Roman winemaking. You get about four years. Almost ready. Ah yes, the Roman days where we all wear togas and drink delicious wine and you know, get close with each other for days on end. Well, I hate to break it to you, but this wine sucked. It was dangerous to consume. Being a winemaker, this ancient sommelier, you would consume about 12 grams of lead per day, just tasting your creation, right? It's horrible. Winemakers would harvest the grapes, they would press the fat with their feet, the best part, right? It's what we all wanna do. And then in order to wash out that size 14 Roman foot taste, makers would lace the wine with lead to, you know, sweeten it up. Remember what we did to Coca-Cola back in the day? That wasn't nearly as bad as a bottle of red lead redemption back in the ancient Roman times. Yeah, I'm gonna never complain about table wine at a wedding ever again. Red or white, I'm like, thank you. I don't care if it's really warm, thank you. Number nine, leech collectors. Dude, if you didn't grow up fishing, this next one's gonna make your skin crawl. Leeches, just watch Stand By Me, you'll get it. These blood suckers have been collected for years, like centuries years, and still used to this day. Used as an ancient medicinal aid, leeches would let your blood Bloodletting. Basically just suck out all the infection, disease, germ, nastiness, right out of you and all out of that wound. They basically eat the infection and speed up the process. A leech collector did exactly that. They jumped into bogs and marshes and just kind of let them attach themselves to, well, themselves. Then bottle them up and sell them. Tons of health benefits too. Some negatives, of course. First off, the leech collectors could bleed a lot. Obviously, right? Back and forth, in and out of the river for hours. Sometimes these guys would even pass out or die. No band-aids, unfortunately. No added danger pay, too. I didn't expect that one. Number eight, armpit plucker. My unibrow, this right here, this is a new hobby of mine. I'm plucking this bad boy every other day, and I'm thrilled about it. Armpit hair, on the other hand, I would shriek, okay? I only have like seven armpit hairs, so I gotta preserve them, right? But in ancient times, they gots to go. Working out was often done naked, right? Ancient Greek naked exercise in the scorching sun, ah, nothing better. So naturally an armpit or two is gonna stink. So the solution here to stay, you know, sane while you're training was for everybody to just pluck their armpit hairs out, okay? No more unpleasant odors, that's it. But the point here, imagine doing that job. Somebody had to do, doink, someone had to do all of them. I mean, plucking hairs now, that's satisfying at least and a little bit, you know, easier. You could laser half your sh But a warrior's armpit? No thank you, the Old Spice guy would have quit his job. Number seven, barber surgeons. If you like candy like me, you've made a regular visit to the dentist. Little numbing here, a little numbing there, a little flavored mold and floss. Yeah, not always as comfortable. Actually, a trip to the dentist chair was extremely scary and dangerous. 
Good news is they also cut your hair. A barber surgeon was a very popular and respected job throughout the Roman times all the way to about the 18th century. These people were skilled at anything surgical. Remove a tooth, get all the bugs and lice out of your hair, eh, I'll do it in one sitting. Not the cleanest job though. Lice, blood, infected teeth just hanging around all day, the smell alone. Ugh. You know everyone had tonsil stones back then too. Worms living in their teeth? They had an extensive understanding of the human body. Well, as best they could. These people were also in charge of dyeing hair as well. Pigeon poop, urine, dung. These people tried it all for that Farrah Fawcett blonde blowout. Okay, so a little one on the sides, two on top, and then we're just gonna yank those teeth right out of ya. All right, should be about 15 minutes. Number six. Toad doctor. If you don't want to go through the lengths of becoming a medical doctor or doing anything, you know, just go the toad route. It's a little bit easier. Be very specific about where you're doing your activities. There you go. That way your competition is next to none, right? There you go. Back in the day, it was the 1600s, mind you, but medical researchers believed that toads had inside of them healing properties. That's me spreading out of a, a toad, so you can see that. So they were often dried up and powdered and then applied directly to your skin to soothe inflammation. Awesome. I don't know what's worse in this situation, the guy getting the toad's guts rubbed on his orbital or the doctor who has to dry up said toad. Both are pretty bad. Number five. Gardeners. If you've ever done some fun gardening on a nice Sunday afternoon, you'll know that your back hurts, there's bees everywhere, and it's hot under that sun. Gardening is hard work. Imagine being a gardener in Rome or Middle Ages. Like no tools, no water source, no sun safety, and the king's private fruits here and queen's favorite red anthuriums there. Gardens up walls, secret private hidden gardens underground. That's a long day. Also, that's a lot of walking pails of water to these things. Yeah, no hoses. Like to walk to the river and grab a bucket and come back. A lot. These people must have had shoulders and lats like a great white shark, dude. Just squatting double pails for 16 hours a day? You know those people were jacked. Also, they didn't have weed whackers, so when you look at these beautiful painted castles and gardens, just know someone was getting screamed at with a rusty pair of shears. Yeah. Also, no lawnmowers. Like how? The whole field? Okay. Number four. Arming Squire. Being a knight obviously sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, the lady, they're saving the, you know, the damsel in the tower with the dragon and the breath. We get it, we've seen Shrek. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, okay? But that's just what being a knight is, right? It's glorious, right? Well, first of all, this process starts when you're seven years old. Then you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. Now, finally, at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but a royal job nonetheless. And also, you don't have a choice, so have fun. Arming squires, see, these lads had the responsibility of repairing a knight's armor while the knight was still wearing it. Yeah, up close and personal. Yeah, which buckle broke was it? Awesome, awesome. How was the battle? You guys did really well out there. Yeah, repairing chainmail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal. Welcome to the Dark Ages, I guess. After these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor, inside and out. Yeah, this was long before Dawn soap was a thing. So they had to clean said armor with urine. Yeah. Hey, let's wash this piss out with a bucket of piss. That ought to do it. Number three. Alchemists. Alchemy in history has gone through a couple of transitions. Basically, at first, an alchemist dealt with everything. Literally. From ancient China, India, and Greece, these people mixed what they could find and see. You know what I mean? See what happens if we mix some dirt and some olive oil. You know, write it down. They were scientists. It's the foundation of chemistry alone. They did experiments. Heavily spiritual, philosophical, and medicinal. Medieval alchemists produced hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and sodium carbonate. They were good. One eye of newt here, little stomach acid hair, and whoa, 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 whoa! Also so heavily associated with witchcraft and wizardry over the years. Potions, elixirs, the alchemist's purpose was to advance and help with the quality of life. Lots of explosions though. Yeah, very dangerous. Mercury, carbon monoxide, yeah, dangerous stuff. They were playing around with things that were really bad for us. For the purpose of making us better. Very selfless job, you know? Number two, rower. I can't even raise my hand in class longer than six minutes. I have to start holding it, then I switch, and then I just bail on the question, and then I live my life not knowing what hydrogen is. All right, I couldn't imagine being a rower, okay? Heading back to the times of ancient Greece where wars were fought through naval battle, left-handed, right-handed, guess what, it didn't matter. Your arms were shaking every single day, all day long. 
When we think of these rowers, this job obviously sucked, it was one of the worst to have, and more often than not, it was sadly slaves who had the misfortune of propelling these warlords into their battle. The payment was also non-existent, really, just a meal for the day, if that. Asking for a break or not keeping up to the rower next to you would ultimately lead to your death. And the number one spot, the gong farmer. The stink of all stinks. These men were employed to go around and basically scoop and clean out bathroom houses. Plumber waste disposal hybrid. You get where I'm going with this. They were the people who dug out and removed human excrement from privies and cesspits. They were the OG waste collectors. But by hand, yeah. And scoops and buckets and stuff. No gloves, no PPE, just hand loading them into trolleys, buckets sloshing all over the place in the middle of the night. Obviously being disgusting, gong farmers were only allowed to work at night, hence the nightmen. These guys would have to hop down into these pits at night, waist deep, swimming around and just taking turns on who's loading and who's scooping. They were paid well though, yeah, usually double or triple the regular. Toxic gases, infections, drowning, this job was dangerous. And definitely the grossest, just sitting on your lunch break, you know what I mean? Ah. Ham and cheese, yum. Number 10 on the countdown is the cat's meat man or woman. We all know that the Egyptians worship cats, as many cultures do. But did you know that the cat overpopulation in the 1800s London area created a job called cat meat sellers? Always one of the most popular street sellers of the 1800s. If you think they sold cat meat, you're entirely wrong. Don't worry. These vendors were actually selling meat to cats themselves. Primarily horse, it was said that 26,000 horses that were maimed or passed their workability were slaughtered a year for London's reportedly 300,000 street cats that were existing in the 1860s. When the cat's meat seller appeared, feline owners were encouraged by their cats mewing to bestow upon their favorite pet a delectable treat for a mere half penny. You may be wondering how this could be one of the worst jobs to have. Well, pushing around a hot stinking cart of horse meat has its cons, such as disease and rot. Depending on where you sold, you could be making a fortune or you could be barely scraping by. The hungry and homeless would often follow her and sometimes burglarize cat meat sellers for meat or money. Also, their stalking behavior did scare off clientele or drew more complaints from the commoners. Personally, I couldn't think of something cuter than a little trolley going around town delivering food to kittens. Prepare to go downhill, however, because this next job is a lot less lighthearted than cat meat delivery. At number nine in our countdown is the resurrectionists. Money was tight for many, as I had mentioned, but how low are you willing to go as a person to get what you need? Well, if you're willing to dig up somebody's grandma, it could put hundreds in your coin purse. In the early 19th century, the only cadavers available to medical schools and anatomists were that of executed criminals. It was also mandatory for medical students to do an autopsy to graduate, and they had to source their own body. This demand for bodies was often unmet, resulting in medical schools and their students offering extreme amounts of money for the delivery of a fresh body. Thus, resurrectionists are born. Sneaking into cemeteries at night, they would prowl around for a fresh grave site and then dig up the recently deceased. However, bodies could only be sold if they were within a certain time period of freshness. And as grave robbing became more common, many family members of the recently deceased would take turns standing guard for nights in a row to ensure that the body lay undisturbed until it was considered unsalvageable for cash. In 1832, the Anatomy Act was imposed due to the actions of William Burke and William Hare, who are believed to have murdered 16 people between 1827 and 1828, just one year, all to sell to the University of Edinburgh. This act did give doctors and anatomists greater access to cadavers and allowed people to leave their bodies to medical science, overall helping end the resurrectionists era. While sourcing the dead may make for a fat paycheck, I think this is a profession nobody should attempt to resurrect. Speaking of the dead, have you ever considered eating off their lap? Okay, well, not quite literally off their lap, but number eight on the countdown is sin eaters. Sin eating is a job that really only affects you if you have a discomfort with death or a religious slash spiritual. It was believed that when someone religious was to die after a life led of sins, such as gluttony, lust, pride, or crimes and cruelty towards others, their family would sometimes feel that the only way to guarantee their loved ones access to heaven is through someone living taking on the weight of their sins. While the act is against the church's wishes, sin eaters go back as far as the 17th century. Depending on the family or the deceased, the meal served may be specific, but traditionally it was just a piece of bread. Placed on the chest of the laid out body, it was believed to supposedly suck up the sins of the dead, clearing them for a passage to heaven. Once the sins had been captured, 
captured in the bread, the sin eater would sit on a stool facing the door and eat the bread before washing the bread down with a bowl of ale. Because he was a man who would willingly take on the sins of other people, he was often solitary in the community. However, sin eaters fetched a pretty fair price for the act. I mean, if it is true that you're taking on someone else's bad karma, you'd at least want to be compensated for that, right? Sin eating remained popular in England and Wales all the way to the turn of the 20th century when England's last sin eater, Richard Munslow, died in Rattling Hope in 1906. Like sin eaters, our next job was one of public scrutiny and rejection. Number 7 is mudlarking. Victorian mudlarks are the original foragers of the foreshore. They would be scavenging for anything on exposed riverbed which they could sell in order to survive. This was the last ditch resort. People would hike up trousers and wade their feet around in sludge, feeling with toes as well as fingers for items that may be lost or discarded in the mud. All ages participated in this activity. However, it was usually those who were the most affected by poverty that were taking part. As a result, those seen mudlarking were considered shameful and the lowest of society. River Thames was the most famous for mudlarking in the Victorian era, as it was renowned dumping ground that saw endless amounts of product travel through it. It was also a highly impoverished area, which made the desperation to make money all the more grand, filling their water banks with the poor. Mudlarking actually isn't out of practice nowadays, but it has changed significantly. Nowadays it can be a fun group or solo activity that on occasion does require a permit. You can join mudlarking groups or do tours while traveling. It seems that sifting through garbage was an unfortunate trend in the Victorian era as toshers make number 6 in our countdown. Toshers, a fun word to say, the job, not so much. Unlike mudlarking, which was in the riverbeds, these workers went underground for their winnings. The Victorian era saw the development of sewer systems, and the poor saw opportunity in them. Toshers descended into the sewers to sift through raw sewage and find any valuable that may have fallen down the drains. It was extremely dangerous work, as noxious gas fumes formed deadly airless pockets, and since sewers were newer, the tunnels frequently crumbled from inefficient building. There were swarms of rats that had little fear of humans, and at any moment the sluices might just open for a fresh wave of filthy water and feces to come crashing through. After 1840, it did become illegal to enter the sewers without permission. Rather than abandon the trade, toshers began working late at night or early in the morning to avoid detection. It may have been a stinky job, but it was also one of the most profitable on our list today. I guess you'd go nose blind after a little bit. Right? Hopefully. On a warm summer day, the last thing you want after jumping into the lake on your cabin trip is to emerge covered in leeches. However, in the Victorian era, that would be a prime location for the leech collectors, which are coming in at number 5 on our worst jobs countdown. Leeches are nowadays seen as little more than slimy and creepy creatures, but believe it or not, they used to be a valuable commodity in the fields of beauty and medicines. This job was often fulfilled by poor women living in the country and farmland regions. Wearing shorts or hefting up their long skirt, these women would wade into dirty ponds and waterbeds alike with exposed legs so as to tempt the leeches. When enough leeches were attached to them, the women would climb back out of the pool and scrape the bloodsuckers into metal pots and bowls. Seeing as leeches can survive up to a year without food or in their natural environment, this wasn't always a profitable trade unless you could find someone in dire or consistent need of leeches. Doctors did use leeches to aid in the curing process of all sorts of conditions, ranging from a stomach ache to joint pain to female hysteria, if you know what I'm talking about. Despite being used in medicine, leech collection posed major threats of deadly diseases and blood loss to their collectors. Suffice to say, I don't think I have any interest in going to a doctor's office if I'm going to be prescribed a leeching. Being given the duty of helping prevent and stop the spread of disease in your community would be an incredibly high honor, but maybe wait to sign that job contract until you hear the details. Nightmen definitely make it into our worst jobs countdown, taking the place at number 4. These men would wander the streets at night working what may be one of the most revolting jobs imaginable collecting human feces off the street for proper disposal. They would dig up the feces from chamber pots, street wells, ditches, sewer holes, you name it. By the time the sun would begin to rise, the carts would be full of the city's excrement, which would then be carried off and reused as fertilizers for the crop that they later consumed. Yummy. Part of being one of the only people up at night means you're a valuable set of eyes. There are reports of nightmen catching burglars or SA in the act, or being called to bloody scenes by members of the public to provide alibis. There is also hundreds of cases where nightmen are the ones to find bodies of those who had met their ends out on the street. After a long, solitary nights of collecting feces and seeing these crimes unfold, a nightman would collect his 23 shillings, which is $75 today, at the end of the week and go home to rest. 
test before starting it all over again. Since we're already discussing dung, let's get this next one out of the way because it somehow may genuinely be a little bit worse than the last. At number three, this is the Pure Finders. Please do not be deceived by the name because this job is anything but pure. In the Victorian era, tanners, who are leather workers, would use dog dung in their practice. Referred to as pure for how it purified the leather and ensured its soft flexibility, dog dung became a hot commodity due to the Victorian demand for leather. Leather was being used for just about anything as it was the hottest trend of this era. It was also being used for things like tack for horses and the necessary creation of shoes and books. To meet demands, tanners needed more dog dung. And so pure finding became a career. These finders would go deep into the cities and their sewers, trying to find where stray dog packs amassed so they could score the biggest load. Whenever dung was found, it'd be retrieved and placed into a covered bucket that would later be sold to a tanner. To make it a little worse for you guys, only some collectors wore a glove to protect their dung handling hand. But others considered it harder to keep a glove clean than a hand, and they opted out of the protection altogether. Yeah, think about that one. I feel like if this next job didn't exist, then maybe we wouldn't have needed the cat meat sellers from our first point in the countdown. Considered one of the most disease riddled jobs of the Victorian era, it's rat catchers coming in second on our list today. The government was smart. It knew its people were suffering and that many were starving and struggling to make ends meet. So they issued a statement willing to pay people to deal with the rat infestations. Every rat would earn people a little extra cash. If someone could catch more than 5,000 rats in a year, they'd earn special privileges. While 5,000 sounds like it would be a lot, it's essentially 13 per day. And it only takes 21 to 23 days for a rat to give birth to its litter. I think you can do the math. It's said that the government's encouragement of rat catching in this time was the stepping stones towards more plague and diseases to come, as desperate poverty driven people made poor attempts to catch these rats and caught the illnesses from them. Others cheated the rules. Some people actually intentionally bred rat colonies to supplement their captured rodents. Rat catching became such a lucrative business that formed around it. And murders even took place when the cheaters were discovered or if somebody infiltrated somebody else's ratting territory. Between the venomous competition and high risk of disease resulting in death, it's safe to say that rat catching may have been one of the worst jobs. And now, what may be the worst of the worst for number one slot, let's learn about the history of matchmakers. No, this isn't the romantic kind of matchmaking unfortunately, but it's rather the business of matches itself. Working what was often a 14 hour shift, matchmakers were predominantly women who were immigrants, living in poverty, widowed, just overall in a bad situation for an era where women had pretty much zero rights. They were compensated poorly, often sexually harassed or assaulted by their management, and even forced to pay fines to their workplace should they be tardy or damage anything they worked on. Working with white phosphorus, the material found in the tip of the match to enable the instant strike anywhere effect, was highly toxic and responsible for a devastating disease known as Fossy Jaw. This nickname was given by the matchmakers to the particular nasty condition that would cause the jawbone to rot and become disfigured. Eventually this infection would spread to the brain and cause debilitating symptoms and extreme pain prior to death. Should the jawbone be removed in time, some women were able to survive longer with the condition, but nothing was guaranteed once Fossy Jaw had set in. Famously, an article written by a matchstick girl named Annie Besant exposed the conditions of matchstick companies in London. Infuriated, the factory owners fired her and attempted to or signatures of their other staff, stating that they were happy with their working lives. Refusing to do so, by the end of day, 1400 women had gone out on strike. Their demands were eventually met, but only 20 years later. It wasn't until 1906 that white phosphorus was made illegal in the use of matchsticks in the UK. The matchstick girls were a revolutionary step towards the deliverance of women's right and autonomy, a journey that we're still on today. Number 10, Bounty Hunter. Wanted dead or alive. The kind of thing that instills an idea of a character that would go out into the wilderness alone to hunt down criminals like Texas Cheddar over there and would be despised by all those they encountered. But that's not actually how it really was. You see, bounty hunters as we think of them today weren't really like that in the 1800s. Bounties were usually taken up by public peace officers, private detective agencies, or companies like Wells Fargo and Co. Many sheriffs and marshals, such as myself, Sheriff Stringbean, took up these bounties to make up for the little amounts of money they make from their day jobs. The actual term bounty hunter referred to mercenaries who would join up with an army for the bonus of enlisting. On top of that, the reward for capturing criminals like Texas Cheddar wasn't even called a bounty. It was actually called a bail. Sorry to ruin your day. Number 9. Gravedigger 
What does a monster truck and a weird dude from Kakariko Village have in common? If you said the foundation blocks that made up my childhood, then you win a prize. What's the prize? A big old kiss from me. Mm. In all reality though, towns in the old west were interesting places, where there were always two constants. Sand, and folks would probably end up in the ground, or that sand. So after the proper proceedings had taken place when someone croaked, it was time to dig a hole. Or in these poor souls cases, a lot of holes. Cholera outbreaks would keep a grave digger busy for days. However, I thank the grave diggers for their service. I mean, someone had to do it. People like to give them a bad rap because they spend all their time with cadavers. That doesn't mean they're weird social outcasts. Well, except for Dompe and, and Seth from Red Dead Redemption and well, the ones from Hamlet. Those guys are pretty weird, actually. Oh boy, maybe we should just keep our distance from them. I don't know, I'm getting out of here. Number eight, saloon owner. Saloons are about as synonymous with the Old West as a single tumbleweed blowing in the wind, moving from stage left to stage right. Just about anyone could be a saloon owner too, from Festus down the street to the previous sheriff to a fancy gambler. The saloons of the Old West outnumbered churches 100 to one, and are any of us really surprised? You'd see one general store, one doctor, if you're lucky, and then like three saloons all on the same street. It's actually probably one of the most usual jobs on this list. It was also one of the most accessible jobs, usually being what people turned to when other avenues of employment ran dry. It would even be what you did while saving up money to buy farmland or to run for your office in your government. And in a town where everyone and their moms knows you as the guy who serves the liquor, you ain't gonna have a hard time getting elected. Ah, I kind of want to be a barkeep now. Number seven, lady of the evening. I talk about these ladies a lot, I know. Not because I want to, but because that's history, baby. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm window shopping only these days anyways. That's just the way she goes. A wise man once said, sometimes she goes, sometimes she doesn't. Way she goes, boys. When we think back and look at the Old West, you think of all the hardworking men and women who made the frontier possible. If it wasn't for those pioneers, we might not have the West Coast today. That means no vegan food. Ooh. That being said, the brothels and ladies who laid down their lives are a huge part of that history. Some brothels became so wealthy that they even would invest back in their towns, buying schools, medical buildings, that kind of thing. The truth of the matter is, no matter how greasy it might seem, it just wouldn't be the wild, wild west with a little girl power. Number six, a banker. Look, it ain't really unusual, but she gets shot at a lot. Bank robberies were not just in movies, no sir. To be a banker these days came with the territory of inviting unwelcome weapon-wielding bandits to hold you up. Apart from robberies, these banks had pretty much zero regulation too, so fraud and mismanagement was pretty commonplace. It's almost safer to keep your savings in a vault at home. Almost. A lot of the time, these banks were just a couple of fellers in town who teamed up, pulled their money together, and opened a community bank. You can kinda guess how this probably wouldn't be the most trustworthy of monetary dispositories. But they were absolutely essential for some people, especially those in the cattle business where you would see around $50,000 to $100,000 exchange hands in some of those transactions. That's a lot of money back then. Heck, that's a lot of money right now. To me at least. Applications for a sugar mama will be received in the comments below. Number 5 Gambler You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to walk away. Anyone who spends time in front of a slot machine will tell you that it can be a dangerous game. Many have claimed one at big, all whilst envelopes with red print pile up at the front door. Final notice? Pfft. That means another spin, baby! Well, this is a similar story of the Old West, but instead of a one-armed bandit, there were actual bandits with two arms uh, and guns. <laughs> Yikes. It's a game of poker, lies, bluffs. Playing the wrong hand could wind up turning sour. The gamblers are the type of guys who roll into town in the shiniest clothes and stay in the best places. And right before you notice you've been cheated at the poker table, he's already cashed out. Number four, milliner. Hey, I have a proposition. So we have hats for men, right? Now, what if we employ someone for the sole purpose of, get this, making hats for women? Well, Jebediah, uh, we have that. That would be the uh, milliner down the road there. If you were a high fashion lady in the 19th century, then you would have definitely come into contact with these fine sellers and makers of women's hats. They were usually located in bigger cities where the higher end families would either live or spend their time. And you should take a look at some of these hats. They are works of art. Maybe some are a little whack, but hey. Number three, con men. You'll like this one, guys. You're gonna like this one. 
There's nothing more peculiar, more strange, more theatrical than a snake oil salesman. Where would John Marston be without Nigel West Dickens? I don't know. They were traveling salesmen who were swindlers, liars, crooks, thieves, selling pseudoscience products to folks who just didn't know any better. It would work something like this. I would show up in town with my traveling cart of wares and mysteries. There, standing on a small crate, like the one I'm standing on right now, I would give the town my best sales pitch. <coughs> Introducing Dr. Andrew's new and improved Life Bigger Supplements. Here before you find folks is a tall bottle of rejuvenation made for the finest ingredients across the globe. Ginger, ginseng, milkweed, red sage, English mace, golden curd. And as if that weren't enough, Dr. Andrew's new and improved Bigger Supplement has the minerals and vitamins that carry you through a long day's work in the fields. Vitamin A through K, copper, iron, potassium. This bottle here is not to only put a pep in your step and refill your stamina, but also cure Here's what ails you. A proven cure for fever, chills, indigestion, cholera, yellow fever, dysentery, and even known to help heal broken bones. Modern science has brought this gift to you today, ladies and gentlemen. And all you have to do now is say yes. Say yes to rejuvenation and yes to Dr. Andrew's new improved bigger supplement. I think you guys get the point. $49.99. Number two, a photographer. Want to never smile for eternity? Get your picture taken in the Old West. During the 1860s and 70s, the frontier was a wondrous, exotic place, which made it an excellent place to be a photographer. Sure, you had people who could draw and paint the landscapes and the people of the place, but people were distrusting of artists' interpretations. Pictures sold you the place exactly as it was. The high quality images were in high demand. Every government survey and all the major railroads had official photographers. Photographs made for excellent evidence of plots of land, mines, and other structures for investors. But that's boring. More excitingly, common people with a bit of money would often go and get really not grim, not boring pictures taken like this. Number one, gunslinger. I bet you when someone says wild, wild west, the first thing you think of is a gunslinger. A cowboy riding his horse into the sunset with his cowboy hat and big iron on his hip. Every step into the saloon is echoed with the jingle jangle of spurs on the heels of his leather boots. No, this isn't a country singer concert. This is the Old West, the life of a lonesome gunslinger and outlaw, riding town to town, either getting away from trouble or looking for it, really. The same kind of folks who got their name up on a wanted poster. Just be sure Sheriff String being in around to look for you, that's all I can say. Also, fun fact, bounty hunting is still allowed in the US today. That's crazy, who would've thought? <laughs> 